everyone, and welcome to another episode of Amplify. I'm your host, Sam Mishu. Today's episode is with Dr. Mehta and Dr. Malanko, two of our authors for the October 2022 article on angioedema published in Emergency Medicine Practice. It's a very practical and thorough review of the topic, and I can't wait for you to hear it. As always, before we start, I want to remind you about the volume of resources available to you at ebmedicine.net. There's the FOMED blog. There are the three journals, Emergency Medicine Practice, Pediatric Emergency Medicine Practice, and the new Evidence-Based Urgent Care journals, all there at your fingertips and also available to you in the mobile app, each with their own host of resources like risk management tips, pearls and pitfalls, five things that will change your practice, and so much more. And for the month of December, we are running a special. If you spend $300 or more at ebmedicine.net, you'll receive a $50 Amazon gift card. Of course, it all comes with continuing medical education credits. And so what better time of year to tap into that CME account than now? Okay, without any further ado, let's get to Dr. Mehta and Dr. Malanko. Hi, everyone. I'm Prayag Mehta. I'm an assistant professor of emergency medicine at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. Hello all, my name is Nicola Malonko. I'm one of the second year residents at the University of Texas Southwestern. Thank you both for joining us today. You two are two of the four authors for the October 2022 Emergency Medicine Practice article on angioedema. And I am especially excited to talk about this topic today. This is something that's quite anxiety provoking in the emergency department or really anywhere but especially for us in the emergency department. So I was very happy to see this publication come across the EMP journal. Before we get started, why angioedema? Does one of you guys have a particularly terrible case that that led to this or a particular interest in this diagnosis? For me, starting out as one of the residents, you always hear about angioedema and you're always thinking, well, how would I manage it? And thinking through the disease process, you want to know, is there something I should be doing? Is there something I need to be watching out for in particular besides just airway management? And something I never really understood or kind of knew a lot about was what's the ultimate disposition of these patients? All right, good. Now, when we talk about angioedema, there's a a spectrum to this disease everything from the histamine to the non-histamine related to the medication induced. So does the term angioedema really encompass all of these cases? All of these things fall under the big giant blanket of angioedema? Yeah, it does. Angioedema is a physical manifestation of a variety of disease processes. So it's not a disease itself. So as you mentioned, there's a lot of different culprits that can cause what results as quote unquote angioedema. And Our goal is to tease through the different sources. So when we talk about angioedema, interestingly, we're always worried about the airway symptoms, but that's not the only manifestation of this disease. Is that right? And that's correct. Angioedema can cause a lot of different physical manifestations like we talked about. You can have swelling elsewhere in the body that doesn't necessarily involve the cords. You can have GI symptoms. There's a lot of nuance to it that I think a lot of times we overlook or don't appreciate if it isn't as blatant as facial swelling, lingual swelling, or like a significant amount of urticaria. Yeah, I found that to be particularly interesting. You know, the GI tract involvement is something that's not usually on my radar at all. And so for people with this kind of unusual recurrent GI symptom uh, with no specific diagnosis, that's not usually something in my differential, but it will be now moving forward. That's a, a good pearl there that I took out of this article. When we talk about angioedema, there are categories and types. Tell me more about those. We, we normally break angioedema down into two kind of large categories. Those that fall under the family of histamine-mediated angioedema, and then essentially everything else, which we like to call bradykinin-mediated angioedema. And within the histamine-mediated angioedema, you'll have kind of your allergic reactions. You'll have some other less thought-about culprits. And then within the bradykinin-mediated angioedema, you have hereditary angioedema, ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema, and several others. Now, there is a nomenclature as well where they're broken down by acquired, inherited, or idiopathic. Does that 
apply to both histamine and the bradykinin and the idiopathic medication-induced kind of cases, or is that specific to one of these categories? Typically, we like to think of acquired and inherited angioedema as falling into the bradykinin-mediated form of angioedema. Typically, bradykinin binds to vascular endothelial cells and it disrupts that membrane, which leads to fluid, specifically water, leaking into the interstitial tissue. So that could either happen as a result of you having excess bradykinin uh, being produced, or your body is not doing a good job of getting rid of bradykinin and breaking it down. And that's typically how we get the subsets of the hereditary angioedema and also the inherited. So histamine, bradykinin, or idiopathic, and then under the bradykinin umbrella acquired or inherited. When we talk about the histamine mediated, is that more common than the bradykinin? And, and are there some common triggers for that version? Histamine mediated angioedema is probably the most common form that I think we'll see in the emergency department. It's going to account for somewhere between 40 and 70% of ED presentations. So I, the lion's share will be histamine mediated. Those can be along a spectrum from just a simple, small allergic reaction, maybe a little bit of urticaria, to full, full on anaphylaxis and kind of everything in between. There's three pathways that we appreciate when we think about histamine mediated angioedema. One is the most common that we think about is that type 1 hypersensitivity, where you have IgE antibodies that will degranulate your mast cells and cause an allergic reaction. You can also directly degranulate your mast cells. That's usually triggered by radio contrast media. Opioids can do it as well. And then finally, NSAIDs have also been implicated recently as a culprit in histamine-mediated angioedema. And that's something I didn't really appreciate before working on this paper. And that's more rapid in onset compared to the other versions. So the histamine-mediated is going to be what we're accustomed to seeing in people with anaphylaxis and it comes with a rash as well. Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's the one that we classically think about when we think someone's having an allergic reaction or anaphylaxis. It's that kind of rapid onset. And, but also with that, it's usually rapidly treated with common adjuncts that we use, such as steroids, epinephrine if we need to, and antihistamines. And interestingly, this can be triggered by things other than medication, like cold or vibration or stimulation of the skin. Exactly. You can easily degranulate mast cells and basophils and so all sorts of cells by by cold and pressure and by a vibration, along with ultraviolet radiation can do it as well. So essentially whatever can cause your cells to degranulate, you'll have a surge of histamine release in that local milieu, and then that can cause further histamine release and you'll get an angioedema or kind of allergic reaction picture. Okay, so that's the histamine the very rapid, more allergic, kind of anaphylactic-looking response. What about the bradykinin-mediated angioedema? How does that differ clinically? Yeah, as you kind of alluded to, it, it typically is a little bit more slow, insidious, and onset, as opposed to your classic allergic-slash-anaphylactic type reaction. Uh, bradykinin-mediated angioedema is pretty complicated because bradykinin is involved with several different pathways. Since this is geared to our ED providers, I'm not going to go down all the different charts and pathways that we had to memorize in med school, but briefly... I'm very disappointed. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, it, it really is involved with the complement pathway, the fibrinolytic system, the coagulation system, the kinin generation pathway. So bradykinin has its hand in several different pathways, and that's why it doesn't take much to disrupt the balance in your body. And the typical patients that fall into this category, like those triggered by ACE inhibitors, that's the bradykinin mediated. Absolutely, yes. So ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema is actually bradykinin mediated. ACE itself, the angiotensin-converting enzyme, is involved in the bra breakdown of bradykinin. So if you're in inhibiting ACE, you're going to result with increased bradykinin levels. And this can also occur with TPA. So if we're giving somebody thrombolytics for something, then they can develop secondary angioedema as a result of that medication as well. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. And in a similar fashion, it does. Uh, TPA has been found to increase kinin levels resulting in angioedema. 
You know, the one thing that I always have trouble explaining to patients when it comes to the ACE inhibitor variety is that it's not coincident with starting the medication. They could have been on it for a very long time, which seems kind of counterintuitive. So at any point while they're taking the medication, they can develop angioedema. Is that right? Absolutely. It can start from a few hours of onset or initiation of an ACE inhibitor or as far as 10 years out. So it isn't really dose dependent and it's not time dependent. And as you mentioned, it's tough to convince patients that something they've been taking for years is actually causing a symptom that came out of nowhere relatively quickly. And then regardless of when it occurs, once it does occur, the treatment is just removal of that medication permanently. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent. There's a great table for the differential diagnosis of angioedema on page four of the article. If you have access to it, it discusses histamine and bradykinin related, but then all the other things that I was completely unaware of that can cause angioedema, everything from anaphylaxis to oncotic edema to muckle well syndrome and all, all kinds of other dermatological manifestations that we don't usually think about in the ED. But if you're interested, that's on page four. It's a, it's a great table. When we're talking about the emergency medicine care for someone with angioedema, we always start in the pre-hospital setting. So for our colleagues who are on the EMS trucks and listening, what is it we want them to focus on when they have a typical patient with symptoms consistent with angioedema? Yeah, I think that our EMS providers should follow their typical protocols, prioritizing the airway. I think if a patient presents with symptoms that are concerning for airway involvement, securing the airway would be their top priority. They do have somewhat limited resources on the trucks. So I think if there is concern for multi-system involvement or quick progression, you should consider treating it as an anaphylactic reaction and have a low threshold to utilize your epinephrine intramuscularly or initiating steroids or antihistamines or fluids as well. Good. So if they have any of those characteristics that you mentioned before, like rapid onset or associated rash or a history maybe of prior anaphylaxis or anything that sounds like it might be acutely allergic, then go ahead and initiate that pathway and, and move down that road. If it's a more slow or insidious onset and maybe the patient's airway is intact, it's okay not to give the epi and the steroids and just continue with monitoring and transport to the ED in that kind of scenario? Absolutely, yes. If they're stable and well-appearing, doing nothing for the patient might be the best course of action. And then in the article, it specifically mentioned avoiding positive pressure ventilation, so CPAP and BiPAP. Why, why is that exactly? What's the thinking behind that? Yeah, so there have been some studies performed regarding CPAP BiPAP use in patients with angioedema. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, you have these brittle endothelial membranes that are very susceptible to pressure changes. And so if you have increased pressure with CPAP BiPAP, which results to barotrauma, it can cause localized increased pressure and, and worsen the angioedema. So really, if you're looking at some kind of airway intervention in the pre-hospital setting, that's intubation or a surgical airway, if absolutely in a disaster case, no role for positive pressure ventilation in these cases. Yes, correct. Excellent. Once they get to the emergency department and we are then charged with taking a history from them, what kinds of questions do we need to ask the patient to try and distinguish which variety of angioedema they are suffering from? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think once you get the patient in the emergency department, you initially should prioritize another full assessment of the airway now that they're under your care, making sure that their voice is intact, their speech isn't muffled, that they're not drooling, that there's no obvious evidence of a strider or other signs of airway compromise. If you can convince yourself that all that's looking okay, you have a few minutes to get a history. I would prioritize asking questions about is there any new exposures that the patient recently underwent? So maybe an insect bite or a sting, perhaps changes to diet or soaps. Getting kind of a history of what's changed in terms of their environment can be helpful, but also getting a sense for what the timeline is. Is this something that just started all of a sudden and now has rapidly progressed and ballooned? That may point you more towards histamine mediated. But if they tell you, you know, I get this all the time and it's usually long lasting, it takes 48 to 72 hours to fully clear that can point you towards a bradykinin-mediated process. 
Some symptoms may be more common with histamine mediated versus a bradykinin mediated. So urticaria, itching, a rapid onset like we talked about can point you towards histamine mediated where kind of having just simple angioedema, facial swelling, abdominal pain, maybe swelling of the lips and tongues and laryngeal involvement, that can be equivocal. But if that's the only presenting symptom, that may actually point you more towards a bradykinin picture. Also responds to medications that have worked in the past, you could ask them, what's worked for you in the past? And they tell you, well, steroids and antihistamines have helped me in the past. That may point more towards a histamine-mediated process as compared to a bradykinin-mediated process. If they tell you, well, these have never worked for me in the past. And there's a really good figure in the article on page five that has histamine and bradykinin-mediated angioedema on there and some of the questions to ask during the initial history, everything from like you mentioned, facial swelling and abdominal pain to rapidity of onset and other exposures. And then it gets into the exam a little bit. So what kinds of things are we looking at when we move to the physical exam? Is there really anything on the exam that can help us differentiate the varieties of angioedema? A big one that we've been trying to figure out if it's a worthwhile point of differentiation would be urticaria. Urticaria is classically thought of as being more of a histamine-mediated process, but I think from looking at all the literature, it's not an exact one-to-one ratio in that not every patient who has a histamine-mediated process will develop urticaria. So you can't necessarily hang your hat on the fact that the patient doesn't have urticaria, that it's a bradykinin-mediated process, but it should raise your suspicion that there could likely be a, a, another cause that we're not considering such as a hereditary angioedema picture or another sort of bradykinin-mediated process. Good. So we're doing a skin examination and then the standard airway exam looking for strider, difficulty breathing that might suggest impending airway compromise. Exactly. So big things on your exam in terms of your airway exam are going to be Changes in phonation, hoarseness, strider, and inability to tolerate your own secretions, worsening dyspnea, all of these can point towards a sign of an imminent airway collapse. There is a role in the evaluation of the airway using flexible laryngoscopy. You have to do it judiciously. The more times you're looking into the airway, there's a chance you may cause worsening barotrauma like Dr. Meta mentioned. It's beneficial to just do it once, and if you find evidence of airway involvement, it might be worthwhile to have preloaded a flexible endoscope and just go ahead and intubate the patient there. So getting them consented and set up for perhaps an intubation right there on the spot during your initial evaluation is a worthwhile thing to do. And then the typical patient with angioedema, it seems, always has some kind of involvement of the lips, maybe the tongue. And then it's a matter of either doing something right now or watching them very closely and performing this kind of serial examination again and again and again until you've convinced yourself it's moving in one direction or another. Is that right? Exactly. Like you pointed out, very often it's going to be a sort of equivocal exam where you will have, let's say, some lip and lingual involvement, maybe not necessarily some oropharyngeal involvement. So it becomes a discussion. Well, is this going to get worse? Will I have a worse view later on if I don't take this airway now? What exactly should I do? There is some evidence-based guidelines that we can talk about later on that kind of look at some of these questions to figure out which patients ended up getting intubated and requiring ICU level care versus which patients were safe to just watch and eventually discharge home. Excellent. And then when it comes to diagnostics, is there any testing in the emergency department that is helpful in these scenarios? Well, Sam, how many times have you ordered a, a C1 in, inhibitor? Oh, daily. Daily, daily. Right? Okay. <laughs> All the time. Or a C4. I'm not even sure I know where to search for a C1 <laughs> inhibitor level in our, in our order yeah. catalog. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the answer to the question. There are labs that we can order that could be useful, specifically in the realm of hereditary angioedema. There's a lot of subsets with type 1 being patients that are deficient in C1 esterase inhibitor, as opposed to type 2, which patients have a normal amount of C1 esterase inhibitor, but it's just not functioning well. So it, I think the short answer would be no. You do not need to order these tests in the emergency department, and a lot of times it takes days or weeks for these tests to come back. So you're not going to get the result back. But I think depending on your patient population, patient follow-up, 
are you admitting the patient? You could consider ordering certain tests. If you were to order any test, I think the, the poor man's or the ED provider's guide to angioedema might be to consider ordering a C4 level. And that's something that will come back real time in the emergency department? Yeah. So that typically comes back within one to two hours. And C4 levels will be low in patients that have bradykinin mediated angioedema. So while the C1 level, the antigen level, or the function level might take days or weeks to come back, you could get a C4 level. And that could be a quick marker to determine if this is a bradykinin mediated source. It's not foolproof and there are further nuances that you could get into, but um, if you're going to choose a test, then that would probably be the one that I would choose. I'm curious, you know, oftentimes we will end up referring people to an allergist or some kind of specialist afterwards. Is there any role in obtaining the labs and sending them now, knowing that it's going to take whatever, two to three weeks before we, the results return? Is this something that has to be drawn during an acute episode in order to show the abnormality? Is it like a consumptive type of problem? Or if they see the allergist, you know, four weeks from now and they're having no symptoms, would their C1 esterase inhibitor or antigenic levels still be low? Or it does it matter that it wasn't done during one of the episodes? No, not necessarily. If you have hereditary angioedema, there are cases where if you were to draw the level during an acute attack, it may not be necessarily reflective. So it doesn't line up perfectly. And so some of these patients can benefit from waiting outpatient. I tend to, and maybe I'm, well, I'm clearly biased in this subject, but I tend to order some of these levels if I am sending these patients home or if it's severe enough for them to be admitted or they're going to the ICU and they don't have a known diagnosis. Just because up to 40, I think 40 to 45% of patients that present with hereditary angioedema are misdiagnosed initially in the emergency department. So I think if we have the tools and the ability to work them up, I think there is benefit in ordering these labs. But it does not always line up with an acute exacerbation having a low level. Good. Now, if they do have the hereditary version, is that something that's usually presenting in childhood or this could be even an adult presentation that's still hereditary? It's, it's pretty variable. Some patients, depending on how extreme their disease process is, can develop these symptoms as, at an early age. And by the time they get to you as an 18 or 20 year old, they have their life in order. They bring their own medication for you to administer f for them. And then other patients could have it their first outburst in their adulthood and not have another attack for several years. So it can take some time to, to tease out what's going on. Gotcha. And then imaging, we like to order lots of scans and x-rays in the emergency department. Any role for any of that in these cases? From a diagnostic standpoint, no. The most common finding in patients with angioedema with an abdominal manifestation is ascites or some bowel wall edema, so very nonspecific findings. There wouldn't be anything that showed up on a CT scan that pinpointed angioedema as the culprit for the patient's symptoms. But typically, these patients are presenting with pretty extreme abdominal pain. They're having a lot of gut edema, so they're having nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. So it's not unreasonable to order imaging, potentially to rule out other causes, but it wouldn't be useful for diagnostic purposes, specifically for angioedema. Interesting. So the, that kind of patient makes me think of someone who might have bowel ischemia in the differential. And so I'm getting a CT scan to make sure they don't have ischemic bowel, maybe sending a lactic acid. And then I hear this report about, you know, bowel wall edema, maybe some ascites. I'm thinking this is still ischemia. But if the history is that this is a recurrent problem, then maybe it's not. Maybe it's angioedema and it's just a GI manifestation. So that's a possibility. Yes, absolutely. Very interesting. It's tough. It's scary. That's a t it's a tough one for us to encounter in the emergency department. Yeah, I could see that patient being admitted to the hospital for more diagnostics before we stumble upon that diagnosis most of the time, I would think. that uh, It's so similar to other presentations that are more life-threatening, I think. The GI symptoms, I'm assuming, are not as associated with morbidity and mortality like the airway symptoms would be for those kinds of cases. Is that true? Yes, you're correct. Okay. 
And then we have the case, we have the diagnosis. Maybe now we're talking about treatment. So Nico, you mentioned earlier, there is some data that suggests which patients might move on to requiring intubation based on their presentation. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So when thinking about the treatment of angioedema, um, I, I like to think of it in two camps. So first is the airway management. We are emergency physicians after all. And I think nothing gets us more excited than having a complex airway that we're able to appropriately manage. And then the pharmacology aspect of it all. So when thinking about the airway management, you have to be ready for several contingencies. One being that you may not be able to have a successful intubation on the first go. And two, what are your steps going to be if, if that happens? Are you going to try again? Are you going to have adjuncts available? And at what step are we going to go ahead and crack this patient and get a surgical airway? Um, so if you have a patient where you're concerned that they have airway involvement and you're using a fiber optic scope and you see that they have lar a laryngeal swelling, it's worthwhile to have, like I talked about earlier, have already preloaded a, a ET tube over your fiber optic scope anesthetize the patient to the best of your abilities with aerosolized lidocaine, and then try for an intubation right there on the spot. And then once the tube is in, you can go ahead and sedate the patient. So that's a valid way of going about it. Um, what you should do otherwise is have the patient fully teed up for an intubation. So what I would recommend is before starting the intubation is maximize your chance of success. So give yourself the largest safe apneic time window you can. So pre-oxygenate the patient. What I would recommend is avoiding paralyzing the patient because once you do, the stakes become higher and you're much more compelled to get an intubation quickly. I would opt for a fiber optic scope. I would ideally recommend doing a nasal approach first over an oral approach. Those seem to be associated with higher success rates when compared to the orotracheal routes. Once you do find an airway that is compromised, I would just go ahead and take the tube there and go ahead and sedate the patient afterward. There was a very robust study that was done that looked at 19,000 intubations, of which 98 were secondary to angioedema. And they found the first pass success rate was pretty high, 81%. So I, I think there's we have a lot going in our favor. The most common way that these intubations were performed was with a flexible endoscope, and 42% were performed by a nasal route. Like I said earlier, the nasal route has a higher rate of first pass success rate, 95 compared to 70% from for an oropharyngeal kind of route. And only 2% of the patients required a cricothyrotomy, and none of the patients died. So we have a lot of skill sets here that we can utilize, and, and there's a way to do it safely. That study was specific to the ED, or was it just a, a group of 19,000 intubations anywhere in the hospital? It was a group of 19,000 intubations anywhere in the hospital, with 81% of those being performed by emergency physicians. I imagine the rest were performed by ENT or, or anesthesia. You mentioned earlier there is a published article that talked about patients with localized edema to the lips alone and whether or not they necessarily have increased risk for requiring intubation. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a paper which staged angioedema by anatomic location. It was initially published in 1999, and then a new one was redone in 2021 to further verify if this is indeed evidence-based. So we call it the issue staging after the author. He looked at various locations on the face where you could get angioedema and what was your likelihood of then progressing to requiring ICU level care and possible intubation. So he broke it up into various stages, stage one being kind of facial rash, facial edema, or lip edema. That was stage one. Stage two is if you have involvement of the soft palate. Stage three was lingual edema, and then stage four was laryngeal edema. So from his uh, observations, patients who were stage one and stage two, meaning patients who had edema localized to the lips or soft palate, had a 0% ICU admission and a 0% need for intubation. So those patients are probably safe to just observe for a few hours and then ultimately discharge home, with the caveat that they would come back if they develop worsening symptoms. Patients who had tongue edema were admitted to the ICU in 67% of cases for further closer monitoring, and 7% of those ended up requiring intubation. Patients who had laryngeal edema were 100% of the time admitted to the ICU, which I think is very appropriate. And they were intubated 24% of the time, which I almost found to be a low number. 
I feel like most of us would probably intubate those a little bit quicker. Interesting. Yeah, that brings up a good point. I have seen a handful of these cases that were not good and progressed rapidly to control of the airway. And in those cases, we had most of the time the luxury of ENT and anesthesia within a pretty short grasp. And so they were able to come to the bedside and we performed a, a dual setup where a crike was set up and the neck was prepped and then anesthesia was looking from above while ENT was preparing to go at it from the neck. And thankfully, most of those cases went relatively okay. And most of them, this was performed in the OR. Some of them it was performed in the ED. I would say that uh, probably a handful of them happened even in the emergency department without ENT and anesthesia. If, you're, if you have another partner around, having a little extra support in the room always makes a big difference, especially if you're considering a dual setup where someone's going to look from above while someone else is prepping the neck. It's helpful to have another set of physician-trained hands around. And then all of your tools and diagnostics, if you're not accustomed to looking nasotracheally and you don't have that skill set, then grab what you do know very, very well and, and make sure that's available to you. So this is the time to bring out all of the tools and the toys. I do like the idea of not having to paralyze them and just sedate them to take that look. And then as soon as you get a view that's appropriate and the moment's there, you can always give the paralytic when the time is indicated to, to place the airway. So there's a lot about airway management that is beyond the scope of this article, but I, this is the point where it all comes to a head because these are the sickest of the sick patients with some of the most difficult airways. So I definitely like that detailed approach that you guys described in the article. What about medication-wise? Is it okay, or are we giving all of these people epinephrine and steroids, or if we think it's bradykinin-mediated, are there alternative therapies we should be giving? You know, for the undifferentiated angioedema patient, I think it is very appropriate to give them steroids and antihistamines. A one-time dose of methylprednisolone in the ED is unlikely to have significant adverse effects, and antihistamines are very well-tolerated medication in their own right. So if a patient comes in with concern for angioedema, I think it's always reasonable while you're getting everything else set up and while you're getting a full history to go ahead and start treating them with a histaminergic mindset, um, always knowing that this may not be a successful therapy because there may be a great kind of immediate process that we haven't yet appreciated. Epinephrine is really the mainstay of treatment in histamine-mediated angioedema, specifically when we're talking about anaphylaxis. So it's a very potent, non-selective alpha and beta agonist. It'll cause vasoconstriction, which will decrease mucosal edema. The beta-1 agonism effects will increase your cardiac contractility, while the beta-2 receptor agonism will lead to a bronchial smooth muscle relaxation and promote bronchodilation. So it is probably the only medication that has a class one efficacy arguing for it. So epinephrine is a medication that we should not feel scared to use, and it's one that we should feel liberated to use. In fact, just anecdotally speaking, one of the bigger faults that EM physicians get from our allergy and immunology colleagues is that we don't give epinephrine readily enough, and we sit on anaphylaxis a little bit until we can psych ourselves into giving epinephrine. So it's a medication I think we should feel comfortable giving more readily in patients where we think that there's two organ involvement or if they're a little shocky and hypertensive. Antihistamines have a kind of a slower onset of action when compared to epinephrine. I think the mainstay of treatment for us is still a diphenhydramine. That first generation H1 antagonist works really well. It removes a lot of those cutaneous symptoms of urticaria and itchiness. There's H2 receptor blockers as well in the second generation classes that can be considered, but I think for our purposes, usually giving diphenhydramine is, is a very reasonable choice. And if we have a high suspicion that this might be bradykinin related, then are there other therapies available? Yeah, absolutely. When we start thinking about bradykinin mediated angioedema, this really centers around replacing what's lost. We made a table, it's table three on page 10 that kind of goes over the various FDA indications for the management of bradykinin mediated angioedemas. I think about it in in really three categories, those being repletion of C1INH, calentide being its own mechanism where you inhibit plasma calocrines, and then acantaband, which is a bradykinin 2 receptor antagonist, which is a separate way of 
preventing bradykinins from reaching high levels. Um, with the C1 INH inhibitors, you have three that are made from pooled human plasma. So with that, there's a theoretical risk of viral infections with it, though that risk is very small and mitigated as this is like filtered multiple times to make sure it's as clean as possible. There's one a medication called Ruconest, which is a recombinant C1 INH inhibitor that's made using the milk of transgenic rabbits rather than <laughs> derived from human plasma donors. So it can potentially alleviate some of those infectious concerns. And there have been studies looking at, especially with Ruconest, will this lead to an allo immunogenic response to it? Like, will you develop a response to the, this milk of transgenic rabbits? And it turns out that you, you do not and that we haven't really developed a large antibodies to it. So it's a very safe medication to give multiple times over. I think sometimes one of the questions that comes up, especially with something like Icatabant, the bradykinin 2 receptor antagonist, which is FDA approved for acute attacks, is if I see someone who I have a you know, fairly high suspicion for this being bradykinin mediated, maybe they're in the ACE inhibitor category, they don't actually carry a formal diagnosis do they need that formal diagnosis for me to just give them this therapy or is it okay to just give it and see if they respond and then does that response become diagnostic in that sense? If your concern for it being an ACE inhibitor induced angioedema is high enough, acantabant is a reasonable medication to give irrespective of whether you have a formal diagnosis on the table. And so it's a very safe medication, and the studies have shown that if it is indeed an ACE inhibitor-induced angioedema, you shorten the time to completion of symptoms from 27 hours to 8 hours, which subjectively is going to be a big improvement for the patient. And then what about FFP? Is there still a role for that when we have all of these other therapies approved? FFP is taking a bit of a backseat to some of these newer agents now. I would say if you don't have C1INH at your shop or you don't have a Cantabad and e calentide, then FFP may have a role there. The thinking with FFP is you're still going to get some amount of C1INH just from all the pooled plasma that they have. But the concentration is probably nowhere near high enough to actually be effective like you would get in some of the C1INH products. Excellent. And then are there medications that are given to patients in a prophylactic type setting in order to prevent future episodes? Is that something that actually exists and that it occurs maybe for someone who is trying to avoid another ED visit? Yeah, absolutely. So it is a very fast growing field and it looks like a very promising one. Androgens have been used successfully as prophylaxis against certain types of bradykinin mediated angioedemas. So I have antifibrinolytics such as TXA. I think there's still a lot of research on this front, but th there is one medication on the horizon. It's called a Hegarda. They recently in 2020 received FDA approval as a subcutaneous form of C1INH, so it can be given at home and the patient doesn't need to come into the office to receive it. And it's been shown to be effective in preventing further HAE attacks in both adolescents and the adult population. So I think it's a ever-evolving and growing field in the outpatient setting. Interesting that you mentioned TXA there as a prophylactic agent. Is there any role for that in the treatment category? We're always looking for more reasons to give people a TXA. And uh, TXA did have its place a few years ago in the treatment of angioedema. Specifically, it's used to inhibit the conversion of plasminogen to plasmin. So that's a key step in the calocrine activation and bradykinin formation pathway. So there's been several studies performed. Uh, there's a very robust systematic review performed in 2018 that encompassed 31 studies. It actually found that there wasn't any significant improvement in patient outcomes with the use of TXA. Anecdotally, I think if you haven't tried it, you might have a colleague who's tried it and noted some improved symptoms. And so I feel like if you don't have any of those other medications, it's not unreasonable to try, but the data really doesn't support the use of TXA in acute angioedema. If it does anything, it might very slightly decrease the duration of symptoms, but not significantly enough to warrant using, in my opinion. Okay, let's jump to special populations. So there's a discussion in the article about pediatrics. Is the, any of what we talked about today applicable to children? And if it is, how so? Yeah, I think most of us have 
had at some point a difficult pediatric airway, and I think we all can appreciate how stressful and difficult those can be. So when we talk about angioedema, I, I think we have to give a special consideration to pediatric patients. They are they have smaller airways and they have larger heads, so they become more difficult to intubate. Somewhere between 50 and 75% of patients will have their first episode of hereditary angioedema by the first decade of life, so somewhere around the age of 12. But that means that somewhere between 25 and 50% of patients won't have it until later on. So that's what Dr. Mehta was alluding to in saying these patients can still have angioedema later on that's not yet diagnosed in the immediate setting. But when you have patients pediatric patients who present with a concern for airway compromise, I, I would just be more judicious about taking the airway even sooner at that point. Yeah, I can imagine that being a terrifying scenario. It's bad enough in adulthood, but especially then in a little child now with an even smaller airway, I could find that to be particularly challenging. Right. No, absolutely. And the other kind of consideration in the pediatric patient is if the patient has significant GI symptoms as related to angioedema. We often treat those, I think, a little differently than we do in the adult setting. When a child presents with abdominal pain, we're much more quickly to think of these kind of surgical pathologies, such as appendicitis, such as intussusception, such as mesenteric ischemia, a perfed viscous of any kind of etiology. So these patients may actually be at higher risk for undergoing unnecessary procedure, instrumentation, or surgery as a result of them developing abdominal pain from, from angioedema. Interesting. So I, I guess it would be very helpful to elicit the recurrent nature of those episodes in, in those kinds of challenging cases. Here, I think the history is going to be much more important than even in the adult setting. If the parents are telling you, hey, they're getting repeated episodes of abdominal pain and they've had imaging multiple times, so we've never been able to find a source. I think your wires should start going up for, could this be a recurrent angioedema picture? And then the second special population was the pregnant or lactating patient. So tell me what we should be aware of in that population. So this population has probably a higher risk of angioedema when compared to the general public. It's really not completely understood, and it's still an area of ongoing research. But what we do know is the physiologic changes that we see in pregnancy can mitigate or we can aggravate or even have no effect on the patient's underlying uh, HAE. Though I think these patients, if they do develop angioedema, especially airway involvement, do become more difficult airways themselves with how, how pronounced their swelling can be in, in their larynx. Um, a plasma-derived C1INH, such as Barrier, is approved for the management of acute attacks in the pregnant and lactating patient. So it is very safe to use. So is Rucanest, the recombinant C1INH inhibitor. The doses are included in the paper. Similarly, acantabent has been shown to be effective as well if your shop happens to not have plasma-derived C1INH. Yep. And these are the patients that I would have a lower threshold to utilize these medications. I know we kind of referenced earlier patients that known, have known hereditary angioedema, do they automatically need to receive these medications in the ED? They are somewhat limited in resources and expensive, um, but due to the comorbidities and the risk associated with pregnant patients would have a much lower threshold to utilize them if you have it available. Excellent. Okay. And then other than the intubation question, I think for me, the most difficult second question is then what do we do with the patient? When can they go home or at what point do I just need to pull the trigger and admit them for observation or decide that they need intensive care? Is there anything to guide us in making those decisions? Yeah. And this was the question that kind of plagued me when I started this paper. Like, when can these patients actually go home? Like, when do we say, hey, this is probably not going to progress and get worse? I think using the staging system that Dr. Ishu created is a very useful guide. What we would recommend based on the papers of Dr. Ishu and Dr. Doss is that if the patient presents with stage one or stage two edema, so meaning localized to the lips and soft palate, those patients can likely safely go home after a six-hour observation period, either in the emergency department or in an ED OBS uh, kind of setting. Those patients are very unlikely to progress to requiring intubation and should be safe uh, to continue outpatient management with their allergist, given that they can have close follow-up. If the patient has involvement of the tongue, I would probably admit them to the floor at the very least, or perhaps even the ICU for closer monitoring. 
And in patients who have laryngeal involvement, those, pa those are the patients I would certainly put in the ICU and may even prophylactically intubate in emergency department. Yeah, this is one of these kind of extreme presentations where you're either sending the patient home and doing nothing or you're consulting the ICU. So it's kind of a tough dilemma. But as Dr. Malanko mentioned, if they're having just facial or localized lip symptoms and the onset has been several hours, you can rest assured that most of these patients tend to do well and could be safely discharged as long as they have reasonable, reliable follow-up. The other thing I would mention is in the patients that you are sending home, Unless you have a kind of clear diagnosis of a bradykinin-mediated angioedema, hereditary angioedema, where they're telling you, hey, I have these symptoms recurrently, I know my formal diagnosis, I would still send that patient home with steroids, antihistamines, and I would send them home with an EpiPen, just in case this is a histamine-mediated process, because remember, this that will be the most common presentation we see in the emergency department. So those, all of those patients should go home with an EpiPen and they should go home with steroids and antihistamines. Excellent. Well, thank you both for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to discuss the topic with us and to author the article, all four of you, the other two who weren't able to be with us today. Uh, but I really appreciate it. It's a great topic, really one of very high importance and causes a lot of anxiety. It's good to see there is data out there to help with our decision making and the number of tools that we have now at our disposal is growing when it comes to treatment, which is excellent as well. So lots and lots of improvements. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to be with us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What a jam-packed discussion about the evaluation and treatment of angioedema. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot. Thank you again to Dr. Mehta and Dr. Malanko, and also the two other authors, Dr. Leap and Dr. Kern, for writing the article in Emergency Medicine Practice on angioedema. I know I learned a lot, and it will certainly impact my practice. And for you listeners, if you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider rating us in whatever app you are using. And also don't forget ebmedicine.net, your one-stop shop for all of your CME needs. All three journals available to you, lots of free educational content, so many videos and courses, and of course the mobile app. It's really just a perfect resource for you at the bedside and to support your practice. Until next time, everyone, be safe, have a wonderful holiday season, and we hope that you will listen again soon. Mm -hmm.